Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Chicago Wilderness Cafe. Today, we're happy to um, welcome the Bird Conservation Network Trends Team, Eric Secker, Bob Fisher, Judy Pollack, Diane Bilderback, Sunny Cohen, uh, to discuss breeding bird trends in the Chicago region. Want to let you know um, that you can leave yourself muted and your camera off until we go into a breakout room. And at that time, you'll be invited to share. And this cafe is being recorded and will be posted on our website along with a PDF of the slides that you see here today for further information. My name is Laura Riley and I'm the coordinator of Chicago Wilderness. Give it a few more minutes to let folks join us. All right. Um, thank you again for joining us today for Chicago Wilderness Cafe. My name is Laura Riley. I'm the coordinator. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I ask you to leave yourselves on mute until we go into the breakout room. And um, with that, I want to turn it over to Eric Secker from Bird Conservation Network. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I'm Eric Secker. I'm the president of the Bird Conservation Network. And we're excited to be here with you all today and to get to tell you a little bit more about the 22 years of breeding bird data that we've been collecting in the Chicago region and some of the trends and results and you know ongoing questions that we've come up with uh, from that data that we've been analyzing. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Diane, who's kind of our point person uh, for the media and uh, just kind of the rollout of this project. Well, welcome everyone. I, I think most of you know us here. Um, we are a coalition of 21 conservation organizations with an interest in preserving birds and the habitats they need to survive. And some of you may be uh, belong to member organizations or uh, work as a BCN monitor. And if so, we thank you for your support over the years. Um, BCN is an advocate for um, bird friendly policy change and a resource for researchers, land managers and conservation partners in the Chicago region. A major initiative has been the annual breeding bird survey that we've conducted over the last 22 years. And that's what we're here to share more information about today. Um, the survey data was collected in uh, six counties centralized in Northern Illinois, essentially Chicago and the Collar counties. It's important to note that the survey focused on actively managed land. So these are our forest preserves, park districts um, that are being uh, actively managed and restored as opposed to land that is not. So uh, the data is within managed land specifically. The target habitats were grassland, shrubland, woodland, and wetland. And we did collect some incidental data around urban species. Our monitors used strict protocols um, for the point count. And over the period, almost 30,000 surveys were collected uh, at more than 2,400 point counts. So this is a massive data set. And we, we required a minimum of 10 sightings of a species 
to be included in the survey. Um, because of the size of the data set, we decided to retain the services of a professional statistician to analyze the data and therefore are very comfortable with the integrity of the analysis. We also calculated by species a confidence level in the trends and what, they, what the findings were showing, and that was based on the number of sightings and other factors. So you can see by species our confidence level in what the trends are saying. We use these findings as input to another research document called Birds of Concern, which we reference throughout this presentation. Um, and the, the Birds of Concern is really uh, a relative ind indicator of conservation importance by species. And um, we not only used our data, but also looked at Partners in Flight uh, species Assessment Database, the Breeding Bird Survey for Illinois, and other regional and national survey data. So what we find here is uh, a bird that is cited as a level one is of immediate uh, concern. Management attention is needed to reverse or stabilize um, severe population trend declines um, and, and of top priority. Level two, experiencing moderate to strong declines, also needs active management, level three, uh, more of a monitoring situation. And then the rare and recently extirpated birds would be those that might not be of uh, regional importance in the Midwest, but they are threatened or endangered in at least one of the states in the Chicago wilderness uh, region. So you can see we put, applied a lot of rigor in the methodology for the analysis um, to ensure the integrity of our findings. So what does, what is the value of this massive data set? Well, first of all, it is a rich repository for land managers. There is considerable insight that can inform planning uh, of restoration and preservation efforts. And uh, we encourage um, land managers to take a hard look at the data and uh, we are more than interested in engaging with land managers to, to leverage it. It's also a good catalyst for researchers. Um, many questions were raised as we looked at the findings and we've included some of them in this presentation. And it would be, um, I think it would be fun to explore some of these questions and, and dig for some of the answers. Um, it's also an opportunity to educate the public about the importance of local um, areas, um, uh, of protecting local natural areas, and to take advantage of their growing interest in birds and nature in general. So you may have seen some of our um, publicity coverage as we've rolled this out, and we continue, and we're planning to continue that throughout the rest of the year. Uh, we've included this quote here from Chris Wood, uh, project leader at eBird. Um, who called our survey uh, effort a pioneer in this space and said he was not aware of any regional sur um, survey of this duration or scope. So we feel like we have something really important here and we want to put it to work. Protect birds. So what are the findings? At a top level, we live in a very um, impressive green space and a special for a metropolitan area and, and including um, habitats that are of global importance for some key avian species. At the same time, it's a dynamic landscape of bird population shifts. So some birds are doing well and expanding while others are declining and they're declining uh, based on a number of influences, including habitat loss and degradation, climate change, use of insecticide, and other factors, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, but the good news is that our birds are doing pretty well. So 56% of the 104 species we surveyed were either stable or increasing. And, and um, that's compared to 37% elsewhere in Illinois. So, um, the bad news, I guess, is that um, the survey covers only 22 years. And if we were to look back 50 years, 
um, we would probably see that all of these birds have faced declines. And I say this based on the 2019 study that showed 3 billion fewer birds are flying our skies. So that makes our region um, an even more important stronghold for these birds. The other important finding was that uh, proactive land management is working for many species, and we're seeing some birds expand and return, for example, redhead woodpeckers, um, and, and others um, coming, uh, you know, uh, as climate change is expanding their ranges. So um, the restoration and preservation efforts of our land managers are, are serving them well. At the same time, managing these habitats for many bird species is a challenge. So uh, what may work for hensloes, for example, uh, may not be good for other grassland species. And this kind of challenge is a delicate balance. And we believe this data can be useful in helping our region become a model for balancing habitat restoration goals with the needs of specific birds of concern. I mean, we have a committed force of land managers active conservation organizations, a core of dedicated volunteers, and for the most part, bird-friendly legislators. So we should be able to continue to make this region a stronghold and a model for other, for other regions. And we're eager to partner with land managers to facilitate and conservation partners to facilitate this goal. So now let's take a look at some of the findings by habitat and do a deep dive. So I'm going to turn this over to Judy Pollack, who um, will talk about grasslands. Judy? Thanks, Diane. Uh, yeah, and hi, everybody. It's great, great to see so many people uh, on this call, so many friends of ours, I see, you know, monitors, uh, land managers, uh, government partners, uh, other partners. So yeah, welcome all. And um, we really hope that you enjoy this discussion of the findings of our trends analysis. And we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say in the breakout rooms as well. Um, so I'm gonna talk about grassland. Basically the BCN survey, because what we do is we go out in the morning and we do five minute point counts. We're very good at picking up the birds that uh, sing in the morning and we're not good at picking up birds that don't sing in the morning. So uh, essentially grassland, shrubland, woodland are the three habitats that we feel we cover really well because th those are places where, you know, mostly all the birds in, the, in those uh, habitats are, are active in the morning. So, um, this is a trends analysis. So basically what we did was, you know, we took our 22 years of data, we gave it to a wildlife statistician and she gave us the information back on uh, how those birds were doing over the 22 years. Anything, um, anything that we might say about what those trends mean is basically um, based on a few things. Um, other studies that uh, other people have done, you know, our observations, um, we, we got a whole bunch of different um, ornitho ornithologists in the region together and got their opinions about what was happening. So, but, but know that statements like that are, are basically not a part of our study and they're not backed up by our research. Um, so, um, what can we say about grasslands? Um, one thing is that grass, our region is very important for grassland birds. We've got the, the stronghold of highly concentrated grassland habitat here. When we look at the rest of the state, our grasslands actually really stand out as being really important for grassland birds. Um, the, the bad news with grasslands is that of the three habitats we looked at, grassland birds were really doing the worst. Uh, you know, the 27 uh, species, half of them are declining. Uh, and and that's, not really, uh, that's not really great news. Again, we're doing better than other places, but still we really would love to know what's going on with those grassland birds. And a lot of the ones that are declining are the birds that are most common in our grassland restoration. So, and again, we're eager to hear your thoughts. If you wanna join the grassland breakout, we'll be discussing that. Um, Henslow Sparrow is an awesome success story in our grasslands. So that's, 
that's good news. Um, and the uh, restoration efforts seem to have really benefited them. I know when we started the survey, it was really, really rare to get a Henslow sparrow. And now, you know, they're in practically every grassland and uh, our results really show that. Um, and it, it, that's also good news because a Henslow sparrow is kind of the closest thing we have to an endemic bird. You know, it, the Henslow sparrow is the one bird that's really confined to the tall grass prairie region. A lot of, of our other grassland species are in the mid grass and the short grass prairie, but Henslow sparrow is it's our bird and, and we're doing great for it. So that's excellent news. Um, we also have 13 different birds of concern that depend on our grasslands. So um, that that's a, another indication that our grasslands are, are really important. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So here are some of our findings and I'm gonna put in the chat um, our, um, our uh, URL for our, our uh, website. So in case you haven't seen that, I don't know why it's, oh, there it is. Yeah, in case you haven't uh, taken a look at that, the, this uh, URL that I sent has, it's got not only a link to the trends uh, analysis, bird by bird, you can go through and look at it. It's also got a link to the um, birds of conservation concern and also to a really, I, if I do say so myself, a really excellent report that we all put together that kind of puts these um, findings in context. So all of those things are at the link if you wanna take a look at those later. Uh, but, uh, but these are some of our findings. Uh, we, we talked about Henslow Sparrow, you know, Dick Sissel uh, really varies. Uh, you know, it's a very nomadic kind of bird. Sometimes it's here, sometimes it isn't. This year, again, it's everywhere. You know, I don't know if you've been out uh, in a grassland this year, but boy, you, there are so many dick thistles out there. And uh, sometimes that tends to depend on what's going on in a little further west of us in the Great Plains. If there's more, um, if there's less rainfall there and there's more drought, uh, the dick thistles might come over here, but we've had, you know, quite a few good dick thistle years recently. So it seems like they really do seem to be increasing in our area. Um, Sandhill cranes, you know, as we know, um, they're, they're no longer hunted and we're doing all kinds of great wetland restoration. So that population is, there was a population center in Wisconsin and they're just moving out and finding a lot of the habitats in Illinois which is awesome. And, you know, we've got great wetlands for them. So, so that's good. Um, mockingbirds are becoming more common. Field sparrow is an interesting one. Um, and uh, they're very common here, as you probably know, you know, if you've been out in grasslands, you hear them a lot, but they are a bird of concern, uh, mainly because they're decreasing out in the Eastern states as the forests fill in there and the little grassland openings uh, that they used are sort of filling in with forest. So that means our region is more important for field sparrows. And it's just a bird that we need to pay attention to because, you know, nationally they're declining, but they're doing, they're doing great here because we've got just the right habitat for them. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, can we go back? Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so just to take a look at some of these declining species, you know, unfortunately, grasshopper sparrow, bobolink, savannah sparrow, you know, those are uh, three of the birds that you'll find in, in most every restoration and they're declining. So we're really wondering uh, what's going on with those birds. I will say bobolink and savannah sparrow are two that have been predicted to move out of our region entirely due to climate change. Now there's you know, a little um, uncertainty on our team as to whether that's the, re the reason for the declines we're seeing, whether that's really happening right now or something to, for the future. But it is interesting that those are our, our two, um, two of our biggest decliners. And then upland sandpiper, you know, they only have that one population at midday wind. And uh, I, I think no one can really figure out what's going on with them, but they're certainly dropping. And, and that kind of brings up the point that every bird on this list kind of has its own story, right? You know, it has the things that it eats and places where it nests and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of complicated factors that go into teasing out what's going on with these results. Okay, now next slide. Okay, 
And so these are, um, these are our priority species, again, the BCN birds of concern. Um, and, you know, our sort of, again, top level um, point on this is just that our grasslands are, are very important and um, grassland habitat protection and restoration should continue to be a top priority for our region. It has been a top priority. That's the reason why we've got all these great grassland birds. That's the reason why we're doing so much better compared to the rest of the state. And um, you know, we need to continue to do that because the birds really need that. Okay, so you'll see these research question slides in every habitat. So you know, we're we're collecting research questions, and um, we can talk about some of these more in the breakouts and also. You know, we would love to have your uh, questions to add to add to this list, and you know, we would love to collaborate with people who would like to um, help answer some of these questions. You know, we've got this great, rich uh, data set, and we're eager to put it to use. I think yes. So I, I maybe if I if I introduce the next speaker, that's going to be Eric Secker, who's going to talk about shrublands. Thanks, Judy. So yeah, I wanted to uh, talk about shrublands because it was kind of a habitat that's kind of personal to me. I did a lot of monitoring over the years and a couple different shrubland habitats, uh, mostly in DuPage County. And shrublands in particular are really kind of a challenge to manage properly. Um, you might kind of think of them as more of an ephemeral habitat or successional habitat. So especially in the Chicagoland area, um, you know, we're dealing with these kind of boundary preserves, small parcels of land. We're also dealing with areas that, you know, were once farm fields with hard woodland edges. And now we're trying to recreate habitat that has been missing for a long time. Um, so for me, shrublands are a lot of interest just because of you know, the challenges that they present for management. Uh, Judy talked about kind of the amount of species that were declining for grasslands. Shrublands doing a little bit better overall in that ratio, but still quite a few species, 20 of the 37 are stable or increasing. So it's still almost half um, that are in decline or you know, we've got quite a few that are rare that lack sufficient data. Uh, again, like grasslands, these birds are also doing better here than elsewhere in Illinois. And we've got about 11 species that are on the birds of concern list for shrublands. Going to the next slide. Hmm. So some of the findings by habitat for shrublands. Um, We've seen a number of species that are increasing, but the ones that tend to be increasing are those that really are using a lot of the edge habitats and also a little more opportunistic. So for example, ruby-throated hummingbird, many of us realize, okay, that's a bird that is often in woodlands, warbling vireo, common yellowthroat, eastern toy. Again, these are all birds that aren't necessarily as shrubland specific. Um, so while some of these species are doing well, we're still a little concerned overall as far as how uh, birds in you know, quality shrublands are doing, those that really depend on you know, more specific uh, types of habitat within shrublands. Uh, field sparrows and brown thrashers, those are two that are holding steady. Uh, again, this list on the right doesn't show all the species, but you can go on our website if you wanna get more of the full list. Um, those, again, those are ones that we've seen, some almost declines, but they seem to be doing well. Brown thrasher, I think, has been increasing since the last time we did uh, trends analysis. This is actually the, the third time that we've kind of run this data and produced results. Um, so that was something we didn't mention yet, but that's also something we've been looking at is, you know, which species have kind of made some shifts. Um, so I think Bob might mention that when we talk about woodlands with redhead woodpecker is a good example. Um, declining species in shrublands that that we think really would merit further study. Willow flycatcher is one that's a big concern for us. Uh, that's a, a bird of concern. You know, our area is important for them, but they're still declining quite a bit. Um, you know, and that's a species you find a lot 
in wetlands, but also shrublands and those big clumps of dogwoods, especially uh, site that I used to monitor, you know, I'd find 20 more pairs of them. Uh, Black-billed cuckoo, that's on this list too. You'll see we didn't have enough data to really produce a significant result, but things do seem to indicate that they're declining. And uh, also, obviously, there's other data out there that would showcase that very well. And they're now even threatened in Illinois. Uh, again, that's a species that we have a lot of concern about. Okay, we can go ahead to the next slide. So again, black-billed cuckoo, that's our, one of our top level species of concern in shrublands. Um, you know, there's a lot of concerns for this bird, both on its wintering grounds, how we're managing for it in shrublands, and even, you know, issues like window kills. You know, this is a species where it's getting very difficult to find areas where they might be nesting and breeding Chicagoland, yet uh, we have people with groups like the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors who will pick up dead black-billed cuckoos that have, you know, struck windows in the city, uh, you know, both short and tall buildings. And so when we think about how few of these birds we have, and then to add in the facts of all these threats and things that they're facing during their migration, uh, definitely a lot of concern for that species. Level two birds, I'll touch on those briefly also, brown thrasher, field sparrow, willow flycatcher. Uh, those are all species that, again, are kind of holding steady, but I think things could really tip quickly one way or the other, depending on global warming, management practices, other things, and how that impacts them. Uh, and those are birds, again, that have a little more specific habitat needs. And then the level threes, I won't go through all of those, but those are birds that, you know, they're a little uncommon in our area, but they're also uh, more common in other regions throughout the U.S. So we're not as important regionally for maintaining their populations uh, nationwide, but those are still species that we're trying to keep an eye on. Okay, I can move on to the next slide. So some of the questions that we had specifically for shrubland birds, and we can talk about more of these in the breakout session for anyone who's interested in this habitat. Uh, black-billed cuckoo, of course, you know, figuring out how do we even monitor for black-billed cuckoos. Um, our detectability rates for that species are pretty low. Uh, many of them quickly become silent once they're nesting. Uh, I've had the opportunity to to see one at its nest at one of the sites that I monitored. And I don't think I would have even found the bird if I hadn't happened to glance at flying into the shrub. I think maybe I heard one in May and that was it. Never again heard one vocalizing during the summer. So figuring out how to monitor those populations of cuckoos is really vital. Um, plays an important role too, as we're you know deciding what areas and shrublands we're clearing. We wanna make sure that we're not uh, clearing areas where those birds are nesting. Uh, loggerhead shrike, that's one that, you know, has pretty much disappeared from Chicagoland. Um, Medewin was one of the few places where they're still being seen, and even there, um, that's been a challenge for them in recent years. Um, and probably won't go into too many of these others, but we can talk about those a little more in the breakout. So terrain, how that impacts species, and then, you know, just what types of habitats some of these species are using. So that's kind of the overall summary for shrublands. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob Fisher. He's gonna talk a little more about woodlands. Thanks, Eric. Uh, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, woodlands in, in our region, we don't often think of it this way, but uh, the, uh, shall we say the oak ecosystem woodlands that exist in the Chicago area are extremely important and are the focus of uh, many groups, not just us, but uh, the Chicagoland uh, Tree Region Trees Initiative, the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Team Initiative to uh, bring back our, our uh, oak woodlands, which were once uh, a very, very major factor in, in the wild areas within the Chicago region. Uh, it is probably even now the most intact ecosystem. And it does support a, a very large number of breeding species, uh, 66 in all. And I might add that the 
the woodland monitoring accounts for a bit more than half of all the monitoring that we've done. Uh, I guess I'm spoiled. I'm a woodland monitor myself. And uh, uh, it is fascinating and maybe good because you don't have to normally stand out in the sun like the folks who are monitoring grasslands. But seriously, they, uh, the, uh, the woodland birds as a group are doing fairly well. Uh, we're, we're showing uh, some expansion of about a third of the species. Uh, another 17 species are stable. And, uh, but there are uh, a number of species that are showing declines and they certainly invite or need further study. And uh, that is, I think, a goal of the ongoing program of the, uh, the uh, BCN trends analysis to continue gathering data into the future. And there are, of course, coincidentally, there are a number of uh, uh, birds of concern within the woodlands. Uh, fascinating substory is, uh, I don't know if we can call it the return of the pileated wooder woodpecker or the range expansion of the pileated woodpecker, but they, uh, I think many of us remember when pileated woodpeckers were really a big deal uh, to find one somewhere in the Chicago region. Happily, that's not really true anymore. They're not common, but they're widespread. And uh, that is a really a piece of good news for that species. Uh, same thing with um, Acadian flycatcher and summer tanager, th those are two species which may be uh, spreading north, either to reoccupy their territory or to expand their range, perhaps related to climate change. Um, chimney swifts are kind of a fascinating uh, thing. They're not really a woodland bird, although they do nest in hollow trees, uh, but they are a puzzling case of why they're expanding seemingly in our database. Uh, and that may be because they're coming to open areas within uh, grasslands, shrublands, and woodlands to feed, uh, but they're not perhaps nesting there. They're, because we have a large list of species here, uh, you can pick out a few of them. I'll go down to redheaded woodpecker and say that uh, this is a, species which up till the, I guess, let's say the early uh, teens, 19, uh, 2012, where I'd really be old if I was saying 1912, uh, 2012 or thereabouts, they, they were declining pretty steadily. Uh, in the last few years, the data suggests that they're stabilizing, perhaps even uh, showing a moderate increase. And that's really a piece of good news. And I know at, at one of the Oak Ecosystem uh, Recovery Team meetings, we're, we're part of that group. Uh, the question was asked, well, why do you suppose redheaded woodpeckers are increasing? Uh, the simple and maybe flippant answer that I gave was, well, maybe you're not cut, cutting down as many dead trees. Uh, I wish it were that simple, but uh, in fact, there are management techniques that are applicable to redheaded woodpeckers that can bring them back as a uh, common, if not abundant species. Uh, there are, as, as you can see, quite a few uh, birds within the woodland habitat that are doing pretty well. Go ahead to the next step. On the other hand, there are some species that aren't doing so well. Uh, cowbirds are generalists. They'll parasitize nests where they are. I find it personally interesting that they're declining. I'm, I'm not sure any of us understand that. I, I, I might say a lot of people don't care, but that's unfair. They're only doing what they do. Chickadees is an interesting case, although it's not a big decline. It is, they seem to be somewhat less common in our woodlands, perhaps because some of our woodlands are more mature and they might not be providing the same level of habitat quality for that bird. But you can see there's a, there's a couple of species specifically on this list, the oven bird, 
uh, being one of them that uh, is declining. And there's at least a hypothesis out there that suggests that the uh, lack of uh, understory in our managed woodlands may, be, may make them more susceptible to paras not parasitism so much as nest predation because they're ground nesters. And it's a really a dilemma for the land managers because uh, reintroducing native shrubs and native forbs and woodlands has proven to be quite difficult uh, to sustain because of uh, the, uh, perhaps because of the overpopulation of deer in our woodlands. So we have some species that are doing very well. We have some that are not doing so well. I'll jump down to the least flycatcher. Again, that's a, that's a case of what does the number mean in a broader context. We're at the southern end of the least flycatcher's traditional breeding range. And if you remember, I talked a little bit about Acadian flycatchers increasing because they're expanding north. It's certainly a hypothesis that the least flycatchers are decreasing because they're nesting further and further north. That's strictly a hypothesis. More data will hopefully confirm that or prove that there's some other cause. Next, please, Dan. So what are the priority species? Um, obviously, uh, uh, we talk about red-headed woodpecker. That at one time was an extremely common species in Northeastern Illinois. It's no longer that, and we hope that it, we, we can bring it back. Uh, there are uh, other, other areas have managed habitats successfully to bring this bird back. Cerulean warblers are another canopy uh, nesting species that uh, uh, traditionally were more common than they are today. And uh, again, that may be related to uh, the availability of food up in the canopy, uh, which uh, has changed again, perhaps because of uh, uh, climate change effects. And of course, whippoorwills. There are very, very few whippoorwills uh, within the Chicago region. Uh, I, I just went out the other night to hear them down in Will County. There's a couple of stronghold areas that have them but it would be great to hear them across the region. We certainly have uh, concerns about some of the other species with, that nest in woodlands. I'll point out the wood thrush, another low nesting ground nesting bird that may be affected by lack of understory. So it's, it's a mixed bag, but overall the, the woodland birds are uh, Many of them are holding their own and, and hopefully our efforts uh, from land management standpoint will allow us to bring back uh, some of the species that aren't doing as well. Go ahead to the next, if you will. Here's some of the questions. Uh, talked a little bit about chimney swifts. It's kind of a strange situation. Are they really increasing or are they just using natural areas more to forage for food? Uh, wood thrushes I just mentioned, and same with oven birds. Of course, uh, the, if there is a range expansion, a northward range expansion uh, going on, uh, data over the next few years will probably uh, confirm that hypothesis. And uh, there are some birds that uh, may either benefit or be harmed by climate change uh, and or uh, factors other than climate change. Uh, did the emerald ash borer aid the woodpeckers? Uh, what effect uh, uh, has DDT uh, disappearing from the ecosystem is that why Cooper's hawks are more abundant today or is it because we're feeding the birds and they have a, an abundant food source? So it's a mixed bag. We have quite a few questions that we hope to work with land managers and researchers to answer. Next, please. We started the program 
trying to focus on four areas, uh, wetlands being a very important uh, uh, component in our uh, Northeastern Illinois ecosystem. Unfortunately, on a lot of different levels, wetland birds are hard to uh, monitor, principally because it can be very difficult to get into or near enough to monitor their populations at, uh, accurately and comprehensively. So we know that this is an area that we have to focus on going forward. And we're not, uh, we just don't have enough data on the number of the species because of detection problems, coverage problems, et cetera. And uh, there are some spe wetland species, uh, for example, the yellow-headed blackbird here, where the numbers, they're seemingly erratic, uh, but there is at least anecdotal evidence that they are largely disappearing from, from Northeastern Illinois. So next, please. So here are the, uh, uh, the, the good news and the bad news. Uh, some, some of the birds that we have a fair amount of solid data for are doing pretty well. Marsh wrens, sandhill cranes are a great story. They are now nesting all over, uh, I guess I'll broadly say Northern Illinois. And that is really good news. Uh, a, a friend who works at, uh, at Argonne said that they have uh, a couple of nesting pairs on Argonne property. And they, the youngsters join the adults wandering around among the buildings after they become more mobile. That's really kind of cool to be able to see a sandhill crane uh, wandering around among the buildings. Unfortunately, a uh, couple of species, most notably uh, black crowned night herons, seem to be doing very poorly. Again, we don't have a lot of data. Everybody knows about the, uh, the big colony at, uh, at the Lincoln Park Zoo, but there were several other sites where they were traditionally more uh, abundant nesters and they disappeared and we don't know why. Next, please. So everybody knows the story of the piping plover and uh, some of the very, very hard to detect species like black rail uh, and uh, bitterns, terns. We all know about the wonderful efforts up at uh, Great Lakes to try and get that nesting colony not predated. Uh, black terns are another bird of uh, high concern. And as you can see from this list, there are a lot of, a lot of birds, wetland uh, breeders that are of concern across, not just across our region, but across the country. Next. So weather, dry versus wet years is a question that we, we might learn a lot about. And of course, what is happening with the black crown Nigerians is a big question because at one time they were much more common. With that, I think I'll turn it back to uh, Diane. Actually, it's to Eric. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric. Thanks, Bob. So yeah, those are some of our results by habitat. And you know, with that, I wanted to kind of switch gears and talk about you know, some of the ongoing efforts and what we can do with some of this data and results. Um, overall, you know, we found that we're really an important region for Chicago wilderness, given trends nationally that are in decline. And we're seeing that a lot of our birds are stable or expanding in protected lands. So, you know, a lot of the PR that we've been pushing out already is really just uh, an applause to the land managers right now. Like, the work that we're doing in these preserved areas really seems to be working overall and we're helping a lot of birds and uh, you know when we look at that data compared to the, the rest of the state we're really seeing that preserving land and also actively managing it is really you know making an impact so you know kudos to everyone who's involved in that um, other things that we can kind of be doing in Chicagoland as leaders in the area, you know, we've got a lot of cool initiatives in Chicagoland that have been adopted by other places. 
the Lights Out program in Chicago. We also are actively involved with, you know, the national campaign for keeping cats indoors. Um, and then furthermore, you know, we're really an important area for migrants. So a lot of uh, neotropical species, a lot of warblers uh, kind of funnel through the Chicagoland area. Uh, people might be familiar with the old term of a flyaway. We get away from that language now, but it, there's still some truth that there's a lot of birds that come up through the middle portion of the U.S. Uh, so we see a huge percentage of migrants. So that's something that we'll be kind of looking at, I think, more in the years ahead. That's how we can be helping those species. Go ahead to the next slide. So next steps. Um, again, this is the third time that we've kind of looked at this data, and this time we really wanted to reach out to you all who are here to kind of talk about how we can more share and collaborate and make more change happen. Uh, we're really looking for ways that we can partner with groups and kind of leverage this data to kind of answer some more of the questions that people have and just kind of provide tools and resources for people here, you know get a sense for what you need most that we could be providing. Um, so we'll talk about that a little more in some of the breakout groups. And each of those groups is going to have, in addition to talking about the habitat, some, some more overarching questions that we'd love to discuss with you also. And again, we want to be a resource uh, for the community, as well as kind of promoting advocacy for the region. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, what you can do. So as far as, you know, our individual contributions, this is another thing that we've been really trying to talk about. Uh, for bird monitors, for example, uh, you know, it can feel like one person doesn't make a big impact, but collectively, uh, the work that we're doing in Chicagoland uh, as a collective that's been drawn together through groups like BCN, Chicago Wilderness, all the initiatives we have, uh, we really create, you know, a much more powerful influence uh, both for advocacy issues and for the management and restoration work we're doing. So things you can do, you know, we're always encouraging people to become bird monitors, uh, working with BCN and the local counties and other groups to manage and monitor birds, advocating for bird-friendly policies, like we talked about, lights out, uh, bird-friendly building designs, one that's really gained a lot of momentum, uh, using safe glass for birds, they're coming up with designs that are friendly for them. And then cats indoors, uh, you know, there's been a lot of research on cats and the impacts they have on birds, which is really a lot more dramatic than people might think. Um, a big contributor to nest predation, especially for those ground nesting species. Um, and then of course, you know, voting for referendums that protect and expand green space. Now we've got this kind of broad stat showcasing how well Chicagoland is doing compared to the rest of the state. Uh, that's really a great testament to the fact that saving these lands and actively managing them is something that's really working. So that's a great way to kind of promote when referendums come up and we're trying to save even more of that land, you know, to really showcase, hey, this is working. You know, if people say, well, what's the benefit, you know, um, this is something that's really working. We can showcase that to people. Um, again, that's a testament to the work that the land managers are doing. And then for homeowners, you know, there's a lot of practices people can do at home. And we've got a little list of, uh, from Cornell, seven simple actions people can do to help uh, birds in their area. Uh, I probably won't go through all of those. We've talked about some of them, but there's a lot of ways that people can get involved both at home and then, as I've mentioned, uh, for the general public also just reminding them that they can be advocates for when these referendums come up or issues where they have a, a voice and influence. Next slide. And this is a, a quote that Diane put in for us. And read this, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Uh, and that's really one of our kind of driving driving factors this time around, we really wanted to not just come up with this data and then be like, okay, here it is. We wanted to really uh, take the steps now to say, what can we do with this data? How can we actually apply this? How can we actually make changes, help land managers and do more to help these birds in our area? And I think we got one last slide. 
And that's just kind of the follow up for more information. Um, feel free to reach out to us. Again, Judy put that link in the, the chat that you can look through all the results and look at that 20 page document. Um, so with that, I think we're about ready to kind of break out and we'll go into those breakout sessions. Uh, we're gonna have three breakout groups. We'll have one for grasslands, one for shrublands, and one for woodlands. So we'll let you pick and choose which one you're interested in. Um, but also we're gonna kind of reconvene and kind of share what we talk about in those groups. And I'll let Laura kind of uh, take over here and talk about that a little more. Yeah, thank you for that great presentation and that information. And we're really pleased that you're able to bring so much of this data to the region and, and the work that we do. Um, I'm gonna open the rooms. If you have any problems with joining, just let me know. You can unmute yourself and just say, I wanna go into uh, grassland, shrubland or woodland and I'll, I'll move you over there. But I'm gonna open them now and good luck navigating your way. So I hope that you can see the breakout rooms. So that was kind of a short breakout. Too short? Yeah, I think too short. Yeah. Uh, well, you get to decide, I guess. Do, do folks want to go back in? I can hey. open the rooms again. I'm, I'm going with it for another five minutes at least or 10. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll open the rooms up again. OK, so I'll go back you want five minutes or 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Ten. I think 10, 10 minutes, minutes is realistic. Yeah. All right. Excellent. We'll, we'll set that up and you guys can get back at it. I'm excited to hear, hear the uh, report out. Sounds good. Okay, how is that? Good. Welcome back. It looks like everybody's back from breakout rooms now. Laura, I can uh, I can uh, start by saying uh, we we had a good discussion in our group, and uh, uh, Kelly Kate made a good point about uh, about. Uh, uh, the use of technology to uh, improve uh, data collection via monitoring. So I, I think we had a good discussion about that. Great. Yes, and we we also talked about, uh, well, the question was, does removal of invasive shrubs and trees impact, how does it impact woodland species? And um, Bob shared with us a, an anecdotal story about uh, uh, 
two monitoring plots where one was infested with buckthorn and honeysuckle, and there were virtually no birds in that, and the other had been cleared and was actively being managed, and it had great diversity of bird species. So that was some anecdotal su support for the notion that removing those invasive species is a good thing. Um, we also talked about um, monitoring a bit and just uh, made the point that uh, sometimes monitoring can uh, sound very intimidating, uh, especially when you realize that you're going to be very dependent on recognizing bird song as opposed to visual identif identification in many cases. So um, Bob made a great point that you don't have to learn every bird song. You just have to learn 20, maybe 25. And then, and then you know, once you get good at that, then it, it becomes a much uh, less intimidating undertaking to do that. What else, Bob? I think you pretty well covered it. I mean, we talked about what was happening with Blue Jays. Uh, right. Whether they were up or down or whether they were, have come back from West Nile. And I think uh, uh, the consensus in our group was that uh, some places they've come back fully, other places they're still not. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have largely bounced back from being greatly affected by uh, West Nile virus, like crows and even chickadees. So, mm -hmm. and of course, crows haven't come back yet. Yeah, and I, I have to mention that Kelly Kay's idea was very cool, which was to set up some sort of listening station for like a 24 hour or 12 hour period. So you have, you capture the songs that are being heard over a much longer period of time than the the survey windows that that we have two five minute sessions and which are also in the morning so you might capture a lot more um, feedback that way which I thought was a really interesting idea so I think that's it for woodland okay now let me talk about um, grasslands I, this is sunny um, I took notes on uh, Judy's presentation and our breakout on grasslands. So we had a we had a pretty diverse group of people, uh, land managers, uh, forest preserve stewards, uh, people from McHenry, uh, Markham Prairie, a GIS analyst from Autumn and Great Lakes, uh, some birders, Wetlands Initiative, Natural Land Institute, Illinois Ornithological Society. And I'm, if I missed you, I apologize because I only thought about recording who was on the group after we started. <laughs> um, uh, Judy set out an agenda to talk about the uh, species uh, first, management, and then research. Um, and Judy opened up by noting that uh, grassland birds require big habitats. And that a thousand acres is like the sweet spot for grassland. And in achieving that, the really task number one has been removing fragmentation. Um, so having done that and found those kinds of spots, we've been seeing more of this happening um, and a big benefit to grassland birds as a result of that. So the question now is like, uh, okay, so what's next to help grassland birds in these habitats? Um, we then went into a discussion of species and of course in short time, and not surprisingly, we focused on the Henslow Sparrow um, for a moment and, and, and Gabe kind of uh, from McHenry kind of opened it up by noting that uh, he liked the idea that we were talking about uh, fire to manage. They're using, he liked how we talked about um, uh, Henslow sparrow, uh, spar sparrows liking um, litter. And his experience was they use fire to manage sweet clover. Um, and uh, there's a feeling that Henslow sparrows don't like fire, but the reality is it's the litter that they're seeking. And um, that after they did a burn, um, sweet clover, that there was a lot of what he referred to as duff. I haven't heard that term, but you guys may be familiar with it. Um, and that the fire left, left this letter that helped the Henslows. The Henslows um, uh, really took off when they, even after they did the burn. Um, so this opened a discussion of, of mowing uh, versus uh, burning. And, uh, you know, this is, I think we all know this is an ongoing discussion. So, um, 
Um, the question specifically is why didn't you mow the sweet clover? Uh, and, and Gabe said, well, damage to birds, because really the issue is timing of this kind of thing and weather, and uh, really he can't do enough burning um, that he'd like, but it's about, about um, having the right time, the right weather conditions, uh, you know, which way the smoke blows, a lot of conditions that can control um, the, the burning situation. Um, so the question about trying to find the balance between burning and other things is, is that uh, the reality to burning is that there's a limit to how much burning can be done because of the constraints on burning. We then went, uh, went into uh, the management issues and uh, uh, Judy started by talking about eliminating Indian grass and big blue stem from the seed mixes um, in an effort to encourage short stature grasslands. Um, and we had some discussion about that. Um, and again, Gabe um, offered that you can't, um, there's a theory that you can't restore grasslands, uh, the short stature, um, but Bob and Judy observed that that is what is being done at the um, Bobolink um, Land and Water Reserve. Um, and with encouraging short stature over tall stature uh, seemed to result in a big increase in grassland birds but then the observation was again from Gabe that uh, if you have a tall grass prairie, you know, don't till it up and start from um, from the beginning. Um, that over time, the tall grass tends to um, yield to a, a shorter grass stature, although that time may be 30 years, um, but it tends to uh, be lower in um, stature over time. And that was about all we got to talk about. We talked about the research questions. Um, but uh, nobody really offered any additional questions uh, and we didn't get very far on that. Sounds good. Uh, for shrublands, I think we have a nice group of mostly land managers, but I think the overall theme was that all of us were interested in how do we kind of create more shrubland habitat. Um, so that was kind of the overarching question. Uh, we talked a lot about, you know, just kind of how we're dealing with a lot of those areas that are, you know, plowed land and then we have hard tree lines. So how do we kind of fill in with shrublands? Uh, we talked about, you know, kind of what, what composition of shrubs should be involved in these habitats and what species. Uh, talking about, you know, diversity of shrubs. Um, for example, you know, we talked a lot about how willow flycatchers like dogwoods, but it's nice you know, other species may like more dense shrubs, so making sure that there's a, a diversity of that available. Um, and also from a global warming standpoint, this applies to all of our habitats that we keep in mind having a diversity of species so that if, you know, some kind of threat comes up to one that it's not impacting the entire habitat. Um, something that we talked about a little bit. Um, some of the other things um, we talked a little on, you know, just Shrub, shrublands being difficult as far as funding for um, purchasing shrubs and then also just the protecting them, you know, making sure that the deer aren't destroying or eating them. And then of course, another big issue that we talked about was, um, you know, how do you kind of ongoing manage shrublands? That's still one that we've got a lot of open-ended questions about. How much can you burn shrublands before it's too much? Uh, we talked a little bit about you know, creating those mowing patterns and shrubs and some of that recent research and the impact that's had on, on shrubland birds. Um, another question that came up was, you know, where should we really be targeting for doing shrubland restoration? So we talked about, you know, again, going off of what was said with grasslands, looking for those thousand acres. Well, on the other end, you know, those smaller grasslands where you feel like it's a, uh, not enough habitat for getting a lot of grassland birds. Those are definitely areas where you can be prioritizing for shrubland birds that like grasslands with shrubs. So, you know, when you're dealing with 20, 30 acre habitat, um, you know, a lot of shrubland birds, I was saying, you know, a brown thrasher could have a five acre clump and you might be happy. Um, whereas, you know, some of the grassland birds might need a much bigger habitat. Um, so kind of evaluating those areas. Um, for shrublands. Um, 
I talked about a couple sample sites. Uh, people were interested in knowing where I'd seen 20 willow flycatchers of the site. So I was talking about Herrick Lake and DuPage County. It was one of the sites where I monitored. Um, and trying to find sites like that so that we can look at, you know, what seems to be working at those places. Um, so we talked a little bit about some indicator species like yellow breasted chat and black billed cuckoo. Um, you know, even just going on eBird and looking up sites where those species are present can be a good way to find a habitat that you can kind of go explore and see, you know, how that habitat's being managed. Um, with Herrick Lake, I talked about one of the research questions is, you know, how does the actual terrain impact shrubland birds? And I think this applies to grasslands a lot also. Um, we talk about dry versus wet mesic grasslands or wet grasslands. And a lot of these areas that we're restoring, you know, were plowed farmland. They used to originally, you know, have a lot of swales and hills and different types of terrain. Um, but since we're dealing with tilled lands, it's all been flattened out. Um, but I've found that in some of the spots that I was monitoring, uh, those little pockets of wet areas really hold a lot of insects and also a lot of forbs growing in there. So we're not just dealing with uh, grass monocultures uh, during burns, you know, those areas are a little more protected. And so I think, you know, if there's ways to create that kind of habitat and terrain, uh, is something that we also talked about and how that could impact shrubland birds and benefit them. I think that's a pretty good summary. We we definitely had a lot a lot more questions than answers for shrublands. Uh, was the mis mystery group, you know, how do we deal with that successional habitat? So I, I guess Laura, if you want, I can kind of wrap up on our end, and if you got any final comments. Um, just wanted to I want to thank you all for a great yeah, thank everyone again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have another cafe tomorrow um, on mapping the green vision for Chicago wilderness and um, feel free to come back or register through our website if you want to join us tomorrow again tomorrow. And um, also, if you want to continue conversations, we're always happy to host Chicago wilderness cafes like this. Um, you know, we can we can set it up on any topic or date, but um, if you would like to continue this conversation, um, feel free to contact me and we can find a date to hold another cafe. So thank you for your time today. And um, I will send out a recording, the PDF of file and post this on our website um, at the end of today. So um, that's all I have. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a great day. I really yeah. learned. I, you guys are amazing. If I could learn 20 bird calls, I would be thrilled <laughs> to be able to do that. I think that's a, a fine gift to, to hone and to have. So mm -hmm. thanks for attending, everybody. Mm -hmm. and thanks for hosting, Laura. It was great. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye. Bye bye.